So to this panel, system reform, is it dead? Well, we spent a long time thinking about this panel and uh, what, what we were hoping to get out of it. So I just wanted to say a, a few things before throwing to Madonna again. Numerous inquiries, as I mentioned yesterday, we've had m masses of royal commissions and uh, other inquiries and lots of reports in the last couple of years. They've investigated human tragedies and system failures. And we have a large body of evidence of what's not working. But what does it take to achieve change? Is system reform dead, we are asking. Despite considerable investment in these formal inquiries and system reform becoming a term widely used, um, research demonstrates that only modest changes have been achieved compared to the expectations of policymakers and indeed the public. So what are we doing wrong? Are we doing it wrong? Do systems change efforts sufficiently target the systemic nature of our most wicked problems? Do they target the complexity of those systems? And how much, by the way, how much is it us or is it the system? Are we asking the wrong question? Is it us or is it the system? Maybe that's the question. Um, these and other issues and big questions, I think, that are weighing heavily on our shoulders today will be explored by an eminent panel whom Madonna King will introduce. I will now throw to Madonna, who I introduced to you this morning. Again, Madonna, thank you. Thank you, Anne. And, you know, Anne mentioned that merger. It's actually a takeover by nine of Fairfax. And given I make a, write a Fairfax column, I think I am now working for Carl Stefanovic. <laughs> <laughs> um, the hashtag, if you're tweeting, don't forget the hashtag. It's hashtag AIFSConf, C-O-N-F, and let's keep that trending. I'm hoping the next couple of hours both enthralls and challenges every one of us. And as Anne has said, you know, systems to serve family needs have been at the heart of government policy for decades. We've had tax rebates, health programs, baby bonuses, education support, and many, far too many attempts at getting systems right to protect families afflicted by violence. In all the discussion about the role of families, we keep coming back to policy reform. What does it look like for each of these areas and the growing areas of family need, affordable housing, long-term unemployment among them. But when we step back, what we really see is a giant, immovable machine with many moving parts. And Bridget addressed that in part this morning. Someone said to me at morning tea, we can fix the moving parts, but perhaps the machine is too hard to tackle. We might make a better bolt or a better fan belt, but can we make a better machine? And has the idea of making the machine better become just too hard, convincing us to work on what we can fix rather than tackle the big systemic problems? That's what we're going to find out over the next couple of hours. And uh, with a terrific, a stellar panel this afternoon, you'll find their bios in your programs. But first up, welcome back to Professor Bridget Featherstone, who had us laughing and weeping um, and thinking in her keynote address this morning. We were also joined by adjunct Professor Muriel Bamblett, a Yorta Yorta and Jaja Rung woman and CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency. Robert Fitzgerald, who we owe an enormous thanks, I think. He was a commissioner on the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse for five years. But that's one of eight... Yeah. <laughs> but do you know that's one of 18 national inquiries that he has held? And Nicholas Gruen, a policy economist, an entrepreneur, a commentator and CEO of Lateral Economics. So good to have you with us too, Nicholas. Please give our panel a big round of applause. We're going to start our discussion with a brief, and I've said a maximum of five minutes from each speaker on their choice area within the topic, system reform is it dead? And Bridget, your first cab off the rank. 
Uh, thanks, Madonna. I was a bit hasty getting up there. Um, I, you won't be surprised to know, know that I think it's the wrong question. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that won't be a big surprise. And uh, what I am going to do is be a bit cheeky because I did overrun uh, my time this morning and I had to miss out a slide that was a kind of fairly crucial slide. Uh, I'm going, as you know, I was saying this morning that I think we need a new story and that I think that new story should be rooted in thinking about what makes a good society uh, and that uh, it's not perfect but that my colleagues and I have been thinking about how you could develop what we're calling a social model of child protection and the slide that I missed out was a social model for protecting children uh, and a slide that I missed out uh, was the slide which actually where we start to try and outline the key elements of the social model as we see them. This is highly provisional, open to uh, lots and lots of further thinking and debate. And there are four key elements. One is that we think we do really have to tackle the big questions. We have to tackle the root causes. Uh, we have to really, and some of that will be easier than others, but all of it is hard. We have to tackle poverty. We cannot uh, pretend that it's nothing to do with child protection, that it's something over there. You know, I come from a country where, quite seriously, there is a massive disconnect between one government department and another. One government department boasts about how it's improving child protection, how it's pouring all this money into improving practice. Another is taking money away every day in different ways from families. And then they wonder why uh, the uh, system, uh, why their the child protection system is so inundated with demand. I mean, the disconnect is so great now that, um, and this is really quite tragic. Uh, some of you will remember the Grenfell fire. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who watched that horror and watched the very inept response, actually, of the council uh, and the kind of bewildered response, it was particularly hurtful and harmful and painful for us because we knew that that council had received an outstanding rating from the inspection agency for its protection of children. And we thought, we're, we think there's a really big disconnect here because those social workers were going into that, those flats for years. Did they not think that maybe they needed to talk about because the residents had been saying for years these are unsafe? It wasn't like there hadn't been lots and lots and lots of thinking about it. So we think that there's a really massive disconnect where we think that child protection is about something very individual, very particular to this family over there, and it's not about the context in which they're living. Tackling inequality, is my own view, is absolutely central, but I know it's a really huge ask in the current climate. Uh, I think it's the only way, if we want to think about sustainable uh, growth, it's the only way to think about the future of our planet, etc., uh, etc. Et but I do know it's a big ask. The second thing we argue in the book is that we need to rethink the role of the state. Child protection is very top-down, it's very paternalist, it's very expert-driven, it's developed by experts uh, and implemented by experts. Uh, there is an absolute role for the state. I've already said we need to think about good housing, about good education, about good health services, about financial supports for families at every stage of their lives and not just safety nets that are, that are grudgingly given. Uh, so there is a very important role for the state, uh, but, there, but there is, and there's a very important role at, our, at local level for local states to really engage with local populations, to think about what's needed in cities like Birmingham so that families can flourish and thrive. And I mentioned to you that places like Leeds were starting to do some incredible work in this area. But there's a limited role for the state as well. We need, and it's a huge, huge um, ask this. We need to stop outsourcing protecting children to services, to experts, to... Uh, we need to start to build those capacities back in communities, to foster them, to celebrate them where they're there. And so we've come up with this idea of relationships-based practice. We think that the notion of relationship relationship-based practice is too narrow. In our country, it's very focused on the relationship between the social worker and the family. And of course, that's very important. It's absolutely crucial. Families find relationships, uh, for good or ill, extremely consequential. But it's too narrow to think social workers disappear all the time, they're not around enough. But also, we want, to, we want a project where social workers and other workers are talking to families about their neighbours, they're talking about their communities, they're talking about who they go to when they need help, who they would like to go to when they need help. How can we support 
sort of capital and bonding within communities. Again, huge ask. I don't in any way pretend it won't be enormous. But co-production is also really part of this project. In mental health and disability, there is much more of a tradition of kind of working with services. We have a phrase called nothing for us without us, which is to, uh, comes from the disability services and comes from service users themselves. Nothing, without us for, uh, nothing for us without us. It will be a really big project, but I've already mentioned the projects in uh, New York. Uh, projects, uh, Kate Morris and I just did a piece of work recently. We talked to 20 families who have a lot of experience of different services over the years. We were amazed at how much knowledge they had about how th what things work and what don't. We, have, we were amazed at how much they were able to say, well, if they'd only cited that there, or if they'd only thought about that in that way, it would have been a much better service. Finally, we think that we absolutely have to embed ethics and human rights at the heart of our everyday practices and conversations. It's not about going to the Code of Ethics and consulting it when we have a bit of a tricky problem. It's not about, uh, you know, just having a kind of like one-off conversation every now and again. Just as we, we have built reflection reflective cultures and reflective supervision cultures, uh, we need to build ethically inquiring cultures. And we, at the heart of those must be a commitment to the human rights of all families to thrive and to flourish. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Bridget. <laughs> Next is Muriel. And uh, Muriel's going to talk on what advice she would give herself if she, if she was writing a letter to herself 20 years ago. <laughs> well, that's how I'm going to start anyway. Um, I, and that was a really great question to ask. Um, but can I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and paying my respects to elders past and present? This is the land of the Wurundjeri people and the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. So as the Zha Zha Rung and Yorta Yorta woman, I'm really proud to be here. If, this, if I was giving advice um, to myself um, 20 years ago, I would say, um, firstly, I would congratulate myself for choosing such a worthwhile career. I would explain how difficult, how challenging, how important and in how inspiring the work I will be performing over the coming years. I would urge myself to consider in my work how I could make the most difference for the most vulnerable children and clients I will see throughout my work and how I would become the strongest advocate. How would I bring about the best outcomes? How, how would I change the tra trajectory away from juvenile justice, family violence, greater exposure to all the wicked problems such as drug and alcohol, mental health, fa family violence and more generally poverty? I would urge myself to be the one to fight for the culture of my children, Aboriginal children. How do I speak to the importance of Aboriginal culture to be embedded in our program services and practice frameworks? But I also went on to ask myself, what do I know now that I wish I'd known back then? And I know that despite its best interests, colonialism and successful governments with their intent to remove us from the existence of this land, that it didn't succeed. We're still here. We are still strong Aboriginal people living on our lands and living as First Peoples. But the past, nevertheless, has left its indelible mark on our contemporary condition that we live in. We are the most poor, the most disadvantaged. And I know the current system is not working. The confronting statistics of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children out of home care are staggering. The Snake Families Report detailed how, if we continue with the same policies and practices, then the projected outcomes in the out-of-home care population for our children suggests that the number of children in care will almost triple by 2036, an alarming statistic. The ongoing impact of the stolen generational and the transgenerational trauma experienced by our children, young people and families is harrowing. The number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care is now 600 times higher than at the time of the Bringing Them Home report when Mick Dodson launched that amazing report, The Bring Him Home, in 1997. On the other side of the ledger, we have 60,000 years, however, of cultural heritage to draw on, to regenerate and to repair our people. There is nothing stronger than a people who have experienced the worst possible treatment and violence and has rebuilt itself, which we are emerging, and we are now emerging ever stronger. 
This is evidenced by the work undertaken within Victoria and its commission to, commitment to self-determination and having the first treaty legislation. So we ask ourselves, is system reform a distraction or the main game? On the, country, on the contrary, system reform is the main game. Without it, change is tokenistic. By system reform, I'm referring to legislation, policy and programs and how these are formulated and how they are delivered. I am referring to the way agencies do their business, the way courts operate, the way child protection systems work. I'm also talking about how we treat those who are dependent and disadvantaged. But can we make systems accountable? Yes, we can with the right policy and legislative base. However, we cannot change a system and assume it will operate on autopilot from there on. We need a population that is empowered and constantly switched on because there is no guarantee of our rights other than an empowered, vigilant people. Individuals do give voice. We raise our consciousness and we raise our awareness of others. So the role of the, indigenous, of the individual in driving change is criti critical. The system is created by us and we as public and professionals we, need to, we know what the problem is. Some of us have power and our power and position is created, created by us in our image and our view of the world and the needs. There are many versions of us that are exclusive and selective, there are device, that, that are often divisive and segregate. We were never part of the us and that characterised much of Australia's past, but we do want to be a part of the future. We did not share the Commonwealth. Indeed, we were excluded from the system that served many of Australia's people. We all have to try and understand our place in the system to see whether we are part of the problem or whether we benefit from the advantages that, system, that the system gives us or whether that system that we benefit from is inclusive or exclusive and we are a part of the group who benefits and then we want to be a part of. Can we change, and in closing, can small changes in practice make a difference? Small changes are the small shoots, shoots that show us what is possible. From little things, big things grow. The future is the present, like the seed that becomes the tree. What we needed to change to make the system work for Aboriginal children rather than against their, their interests, that's what we're working to. We now have cultural activities and programs that are part of the way that we work. We want a stronger Aboriginal community. We do not want to be recipients of a system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muriel. And we're pleased you chose this career too. Robert Fitzgerald is next, and he is looking at the importance of context in reform. Australia is very good at actually changing systems. The question is whether it changes it for the good or not. When Muriel was speaking and talking about the Sodolan generation, that was a dramatic system change. By a system on another system. By a culture on another culture. And at its heart, it was one culture, one society, determining for another a very different outcome. And the question in that area, when we forcibly removed children from their families, what was the objective of that program? When we took child migrants from Britain and from Malta and took them from institutions in those countries and put them into institutions in Australia where they were abused both sexually and physically, we had a dramatic effect not only on their lives but in fact the creation of a system of boys' and girls' homes and orphanages in Australia. And what were we seeking to achieve? And most importantly, what were we thinking in relation to those children? How did we value them? What did we expect for them? And then what did we allow to be done to them? In a very positive sense, however, Australia is capable of extraordinary change and in the recent eras. But there are three things that normally precede good change in Australia. The first is there has to be a crisis, a crisis of confidence in the current system, that it no longer successfully meets the needs of the people that it seeks to serve. And the second is a galvanising theme or a coherent view about what is required. And the third thing I'll come back to is about the value of the individual. So in relation to the disability area, the NDIS, for all of its faults, is a system that was brought out firstly of crisis, that the disability service system was not meeting the needs of people with disability, but secondly, a galvanising theme by people with disability that they wanted to change the locus of control 
and choice. They wanted control and choice over the services that would be delivered to them. And as a consequence of that, extraordinary reform was achieved and is being undertaken at the moment. It wasn't necessarily driven by an economics agenda or even a market-focused agenda. That was the galvanising theme. In relation to aged care, a huge change took place some years ago and is evolving. By 2050, 3.6 million Australians will receive aged care every year. 3 million will receive it in the home. Just a short few years ago, the whole of the aged care system was focused to residential care, where the individual was simply going to be a consumer of a residential service. Today, we have completely changed that system to a community-based, home-based system. A remarkable change, one, because the system was failing, and secondly, it tapped into a galvanising theme by citizens that they wanted to be served within their home, and we delivered. Third, the question, therefore, in relation to family and children's services, have we come to the point where we think the service systems that support families and vulnerable children is broken? I think the answer is yes. But the second part of it is not yet clear to me, that we have a coherent and galvanising theme around what we expect for vulnerable families and children. And until we have that, until there is some sort of view amongst you and others that this is what we believe to be the underpinning um, structure of a new system, we won't quite get there. But the most important thing is how do we value vulnerable families and children? What are our expectations for them? What is the system actually meant to desi designed to achieve? And the work of the Royal Commission demonstrated that. 70% of those that were abused were abused in non-government organisations. 70%. 30% in states. And yet at any point in that history of that inquiry, people would have said to you, these are great institutions, protecting children, delivering good outcomes. And the community believed it. They believed it and took their eye off the game. They allowed institutions to do effectively what they liked. And what we saw in good institutions and bad institutions was fundamentally how you valued and saw the children in your care. Did you value them in the way or devalue them as helpless and hopeless, spawn of their parents, future criminals, people to be saved despite themselves? Or did we see in those children something that could be empowered, enlivened, to live full and beautiful lives? And across Australia, even in recent times, different organisations valued those children differently. And the outcomes are seen in the reports of the Royal Commission. But today the same thing is true for vulnerable families, for vulnerable children, for young people. And I'm not sure that we have a coherent view in Australia yet about how we value those particular groups and what our expectations might be for them. So many questions there. Please give Robert a, a round of applause. We've all painted system reform as difficult, and it is really difficult, isn't it, Nicholas? It's really difficult. <laughs> That's his five minutes. <laughs> I want to ask... I want to um, ask you a question. Uh, who knows what country in the world was the first country to abolish slavery? This one. We don't know that, but um, Arthur Phillip, Governor Arthur Phillip, refused to take... Admiral Arthur Phillip, as he then was, refused to take the commission if slavery was to be tolerated in Australia. 1787. Um, I raise that because Arthur Phillip came here full of good intentions. He came here full of good intentions towards the Indigenous people. The the colonisation slash invasion of Australia was done, relatively speaking, with greater good intent than any other colonisation to that point. And it wasn't noticeably successful. And I want to suggest to you that something, that child protection is roughly the same kind of problem. It's a, a problem of diff ships passing in the night, different cultures, Cultures so dominant that they don't know how they dominate the other. Uh, and um, I want to start with that observation. I then want to tell you that uh, a, a big thing for me was being asked to chair the 
so, uh, Australian Centre for Social Innovation, Taxi. My first question was, what's social innovation? My next answer was yes. I still haven't worked out what social innovation is, by the way. Um, but when I took that job on, I, 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 was, I think I was asked to do the job because I was an economist and we all know what serious people economists are. We all know how they are very rigorous, as another Minister for the Arts said to me when he put me on an arts body, we need some rigour around this. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> um, so I was chair of taxi and I was giving rigour to the process. <laughs> Uh, and I began that process as what I would call a tragic liberal. Uh, the, the beginning of tragic liberalism is Tony Abbott's words, the poor will always be with us. I certainly believe that. I even believe that now. But what I believed then was that the poor, the underclass, if you like, would always be with us and there isn't much we can do. And we can try, and the liberal part, as opposed to the tragic conservative, which is who cares... Uh, the Liberal part of me said, well, OK, uh, we may not be able to do much, but we can at least in this incredibly prosperous world try and be generous and see what we can do. And exposure to taxis' methods of co-design and so on showed me that really we can be quite successful. Uh, we won't be 100% successful, but we can be a lot better at this. And... I became optimistic at least about how to... that we actually know enough to design interventions that can powerfully mo mobilise people's desire to have a better life, roughly on their terms, if you're with me. Not on our terms, but on their terms. And so we built... Uh, the, 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 the program that I was used to illustrate, this is Family by Family, uh, we were asked to build, in effect, an early intervention program to prevent families falling into crisis and us having to take their kids off them. I thought to myself, hell, how the hell do you do that? Uh, we hung around with families and we built a model which doesn't throw away professional knowledge but, as I like to put it, provides professional knowledge into the system as midwife, not as obstetrician. Uh, so we had families mentoring other families and it was visibly, viscerally powerful. Um, family by family spread from South Australia to New South Wales and then that was that. We, it was, it's been in four suburbs in New South Wales and, five, and one suburb in... Sorry, four suburbs, suburbs in South Australia and one suburb in New South Wales for... Um, she wants me to stop. Yeah. Uh, Just trying to introduce more. a bit of rigour. One more, well, one more minute, minute. You, you, you're going to like it, you're going to like it. <laughs> um, so four suburbs in South Australia, one suburb in New South Wales, for about five years, it didn't grow, it didn't shrink. It's now shrunk in New South Wales, it seems. Uh, so there's a whole lot more to think about other than being able to do this. I want to leave you with another history story. Who knows of Ned Kelly's sash? It's amazing, isn't it? We don't know our history. When Ned, Kelly's, when Ned Kelly was 11 years old, I crack up when I tell this story, he saved the life of a uh, son of a local farmer. The farmer gave him a green sash. And when they took the armour off him as the only survivor of that mad adventure in Glen, Glen Rowan, through his blood-soaked clothes. He, he was wearing the green sash. And that's what we have to try and do. We have to stop these tragedies where people entirely capable of leading great lives are somehow bewildered out of those great lives. That's what we have to do. Thank you, Nicholas. So we all agree something has to be done. It comes to what we do and how we do it. And Bridget, I'll start with you. We, we've all talked about issues around the system. Do you believe, you've said we need to tackle the big questions, the role of the state needs to change. Is your view of reform possible? And if we don't, what are the consequences? I think the future is... Uh 
the, some of the kind of developments in the US where you have very, very, very scary system that people are absolutely terrified of, particularly African-American people. They won't, women won't tell people that they're being beaten up because they're too scared, their kids will be taken off them. The future is a very, very restricted service, a very scary service, a, a service that people have no commitment to or investment in. And speaking of scared, people will be scared of those people as well. The community will be scared Absolutely. of those people. OK, so let me go to you, Robert. You know, you've conducted 18 national inquiries um, and I want to tap into what you've learnt. Of those 18, how many of them do you think has fundamentally reformed a system? How many of those would you say, yep, that was a success? All of them have impacted systems and I'd say, you know, half of them are fundamental changes. Um, the way in which the aged care is the classic illustration, which was an inquiry, um, the Productivity Commission did the disability inquiry, which I've referred to, um, and many others. Um, but they don't have... An, uh, the drivers for change come from multiple f sources. They don't come from one source and they have to coalesce. So many people say, well, this has been driven by X or Y, but my experience has been really good quality uh, reform is being driven by multiple factors. The one that actually leads to the best outcome is where that reform is being driven by the people that will be affected by the system itself. Mm. And in family and children, we treat them as merely the recipients of services. Correct. In the disability reform, it was the people with disability that fundamentally demanded something different. And yes, it had a lot of economic and, uh, and competition theory behind the actual design. Some for good, some not for good. Again, I want to go back to the example I used, aged care. Fundamentally, it was people, i.e.g. in Australia, saying, we don't want this system. Mm. We want something different. Now, the problem we've got in vulnerable families and vulnerable children is that voice is not heard. When I was president of ACOS, I used to say, you know, we're about the only country in the world where the unemployed would never march. Didn't matter what you do, they would never come out. And that's true. But in a very different way, the same thing. So, mm. so in a sense, mm. what galvanises um, the, the movement if it's not from the people themselves, but those that are advocating for or working with them. And that comes to the fundamental point that I make. What is your expectation... What is your view of those people and your expectations for them? And do you genuinely represent what they aspire to? And what we saw in the Royal Commission is nobody cared. Hmm. The system did not care what children thought, and then when they became vulnerable adults, whether they went into prison or stayed outside, the system continued to not to care. All right. We will come back a little bit later to how we hear the voice of a child. But you've mentioned your latest inquiry. Would you just spend a minute telling us, as a person, what did that inquiry teach you? Look, I think there's so many aspects, but there's two or three things. The firstly is, uh, I think, empathy. One of the most critical issues that I've learned from that inquiry is you have to bring head and heart to what we do. And in the human services, at the end of the day, the thing that I think makes successful reform is that. It is when we think with our heads and we are creative and innovative and we look around at the world and say, how can we do this better? And at the end of the thing, we drive that reform because of the heart. And child protection in Australia, coming from the, the Royal Commission, had its essence really going back to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children. That was when we fundamentally started to see children differently. It wasn't that we actually became concerned that children were being abused. The, free, the, the start of this was we actually saw children differently. And after the Royal Commission, I have to say to you, I see children differently. My own, yours and others. Um, How so? I think that what we see to them is people that have the capacity and the opportunity to live brilliant lives, good lives, effective lives. And our purpose and our systems must be to empower them to be able to achieve that. Now, sometimes that's removing barriers. Sometimes that's providing additional resources. Sometimes it's putting in place a relationship-based model of care and support, which I believe is the way forward. All of those happens, but at the end of the day, I look at a child and say, that is a child of enormous potential. Previously, we saw that child through all the deficits, yes. the failures that they would be and the failures that they have. And remember that in basic family work, there was a notion of called the optimism of theory or the optimism approach. Family workers believe that they bring to the family not the salvation but the resources to enable that family to, in fact, their, live, make their own choices and live their life to the fullest. 
Family work is always about saying, we see in this family this potential. We will aid and assist and develop that. We will put the support practices. But at the end of the day, that family has within it what it takes to, to make a change. All, all right. We'll leave it there and come back to that. Can I go to you, Nicholas, here, and just taking a step back and looking at broad broad reform. You argue that it's difficult, it's complex. You know, parts of it can be like ships in the night. Where do you think it usually fails? What's the crux? And would you argue that aged care and NDIS are examples of really good fundamental reform? Um, too early to tell, as um, Joe and Lies said to have said to Richard Nixon when he asked what he thought of the <laughs> French Revolution. Um, but um, it really is too early to tell. I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic, possibly more with my heart in my mouth than Robert, but I think Robert's heart's in his mouth too. Um, what's happened is that politicians have been cajoled into making grand statements and if we were doing this really scientifically, we wouldn't do that. We'd say, trial it over here. But if you say trial it over here, that's the end of your national program right there. It'll be trialled, it'll be, you know, it'll be nice enough, and then we'll, it'll run for five years and then it'll be kind of closed down or it'll be kept for 20 years, who knows? Um, so we've decided that we're going to do this. We've got these big architectural ideas, which many of which echo economists' ideas about how markets work, competition and so on, uh, choice and competition. Um, and these are markets in which that model has a reasonable chance of not making things great, but making things better than the, the paternalistic system that we've had. Um, as Robert has intimated, that's much harder with children. It's much harder with traumatised families and so on. Um, so that's the beginning of it. But, I mean, there is really the death of a thousand cuts. Wherever you look, there are upper-middle-class people waiting to screw you over. So, for instance, just let me give you an example. We did a... Uh, we, we spent a lot of money on an evaluation of Family by Family, the program that I mentioned to you. I think it took nine months to get ethics approval through five different ethics committees. Now, what do ethics committees do? They get the NHMRC guidelines, they're 75 pages, and they go through it and they look for the downside, they look for the front, they apply the front page test. What if something happens and it ends up on the front page? They're not supposed to do this, but that's what in, in effect happens. In the end, we were told by the professionals I wanted to push harder on that because I simply regarded this answer as outrageous and I didn't want to accept it, but we did accept it. We were told that we couldn't evaluate the effect of the program on children because it was too hard to get ethics approval. Mm, sure. That's pretty ethical, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't that ethical? Sure. Now, that's just ethics approval. OK, so I've just started. OK, so the, the, obviously big problems. I, I'm putting you on notice. I'm going to come back to you shortly and ask you what ingredients you think would make good reform. But, Muriel, you've been sitting there patiently and we've heard Robert talk about, you know, often us seeing things in, in deficit terms. We've heard Nicholas talk about the role of politicians here. What are you thinking? Um, I think um, I'm just absolutely amazed that we've had three years, perhaps four, nearly four years of a government that gets self-determination and I just struggle with why is it so hard for Aboriginal? Why for the first time we've seen a 70% increase in funding to Aboriginal services? We all, now we're seeing that we, um, the importance of culture, the importance of family finding, genealogy, Aboriginality, all of those connections to land, returning children to country that are in out of home care, all the things that would work for Aboriginal, and it's with a government that understands. And so um, is that hard to achieve nationally? And why, why only in the last four years? And so we've got a minister that basically says we will do better for Aboriginal. And, we, and so there's a change in policy. Now we have a policy of government that all funding for Aboriginal will go to Aboriginal. There's a commitment to transition all Aboriginal children case managed to non-Aboriginal and to government back to Aboriginal communities. Now, it's not how will we do it, when will we do it. It's, it's, it's basically saying it will happen. So why now? And we're starting to see the result of that. And so I now have guardianship. 
of 34 children and there's a commitment to transfer guardianship of all children. I think system reform, and I reckon guardianship for... I think when we find, when we put the evidence before government, how guardianship works for Aboriginal children, I believe we'll find that guardianship for all children will work better when outside of government. OK, so, Bridget, I can't help thinking, you know, what, what everyone has said, risk envelops everything in relation to what we're talking about. And I, I don't know how I say this, but are we in policy terms worried that a child will die? Is yeah. that what's driving yes. it? The system Absolutely. is driven by That's the, the fear imperative. of children dying. Being and I don't know what happens here. Yeah, it's yeah. driven by risk aversion. But I do know that at, at really crucial points, politicians have used that fear for whatever purpose, whether it's to get at the previous government or to uh, attack the public sector or to say, you know, such, whatever. But yes, risk of, we, we, we're obsessed with children dying. And so we drag all sorts of people into the system inappropriately and manage this manage young people for example young people who are exhibiting risky behaviors we treat them in the same way as we treat babies who can't speak Nicholas, often. not always but often Robert, Robert. But, oh, sorry, but you've Robert. got to be very careful here um, that's true but when you look at the public service for example all your agencies uh, what is the reward, what are the incentives inside government or your agencies to allow a person on the front line to act differently? Mm. All mm. of these structures inside government and many of the agencies say to that frontline worker, mm. don't take the risk. Yeah. Mm. Because they know that if it goes wrong, I'm not talking about the death of a child, just a poor placement of that, they won't be either supported or worse than that, they mm. will in fact be punished for that. Absolutely. And so what's happening in government is... Employees in governments only act according to the incentives that operate in government. So if you have a government agency that is totally about punishing wrongdoing, about blaming people, about not supporting its workforce, about not taking innovative approaches, don't expect the individual to act perversely to that. And they don't. And the same thing happens in non-government agencies. So if you want us to operate differently, at the highest level, ministerial, at secretary, at CEO level, at board level, if it's an NGO, you've got to say, we want you to operate differently and we will support you. Sometimes it will go wrong and most times it will go right. It, now, if that culture doesn't exist, do not expect the frontline person to act differently. And what are they going to do? They're going to act in a risk-averse fashion. And the reason we have such high numbers of children being removed from home is partly because of that. All right. So can I go back to Bridget on that? Because you want to yeah. jump in there. But I also want to know whether that culture is everywhere or do we stand no, no, out there? No, no. I, I have good news and bad news on it. I totally agree with you that it is very rare for a, a po national politician to stand up and to say, look... It's unavoidable that children die. And actually, in our situation, the numbers are really, really rare and they're in long-term decline. They're re I mean, I've got the figures. They're absolutely rare. So it's very rare at a national level. But I have to give you good news. We have very brave managers. We have very brave directors of, of local authorities who stand up and say, I will have your back as long as you actually haven't done something so completely wrong. But of course, there has to be personal and professional accountability. I will have your back. And they work with their local politicians. We do, it's not brilliant, but we do, we are working with politicians to increase their understanding of the complexities of the work. OK, Nicholas, I wonder, though, in Australia, our three-year election cycles kind of makes it difficult for a, a politician to be really brave, doesn't it? Yes. Mm. Um... <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I, I wanted to just develop Robert's point. This is Peter Shergold in 2005. If there were a single cultural predilection in the APS that I would change, it would be the unspoken belief of many that contributing to the development of government policy is a higher order function, more prestigious, more influential, more exciting than delivering results. Um, that's true in Australia, it's true in Canada, it's true pretty much everywhere the commanding heights of the system are in policy. And um, we are in an area in which the real learning has to happen in the field, on the ground. Now, there are some policy implications about how you systematise a system that might have learnt how to do that. But we have a system... And if anyone out there has any medical knowledge of a 
system in our body or some other organism's body where the arteries are just pumping fine and the capillaries have all gone to mush, that's the image, that's the disease that I'd like for my metaphor. Um, and if we can't fix that, and it's a very hard thing to fix, it can't be fixed with a statement, um, because I'll tell you what will happen. A statement, a recommendation, you know what will happen to the recommendation? It'll be accepted. And, the, and, and that's what happened with the government inquiry that I chaired in 2009. It's called the Government 2.0 Task Force. And the government, and it was all about allowing data to uh, flow free where it should flow free and to, to go to its most valuable use and be liquid around the public service. And so we knew more about what we were doing. And the secret of what happened is not that the government didn't accept the recommendations, they did accept the recommendations. And then the Productivity Commission came along, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, and released a report on essentially the same thing, on data, and came up with all the same recommendations, mentioned that ours were, mentioned that ours, you know, mentioned our recommendations and said, you really should get serious about this. Um, but I mean, as I've suggested to the Thody review, I think, uh, into the public service, chaired by David Thirty, which is ongoing right now, if you don't make amnesia an important theme, if you don't ring the bell on amnesia, that it's possible to actually implement all these recommendations and the arteries are willing and the capillaries are nowhere to be seen, we will just go through this again and again. Uh, so all the status rewards, all the career rewards are at the top, People make policies, they go all over the place, they introduce a new policy. I mean, um, uh, the, the most striking example of this was in a state where we did some consulting in taxi where they had decided that what we needed was more reunification of children from with families that they had been removed from. That sounds like maybe a good idea. It all depends on whether you can do it properly. Well, you would need at least two things, good... Um, a good capacity to identify the most prospective families and good support for those families. After four or five years of this policy, the success rate was 30%, and one office had got their success rate to 85%. That's a big story, isn't it? And, but, of course, the policy itself was in pretty bad odour by that stage, so the policy was closed down. The office was scattered to the winds... They weren't promoted particularly. And the centre, as I understand it, never ever knew, never even knew. OK. So can I go to Muriel here? Because none of that would be new to you in terms of Indigenous affairs, would it? Yeah, and I mean, I guess there's a sense of frustration because even talk, everybody talking up here about what's good and what's best practice. And, but, you know, I live in a country where there's no real standards. I mean, in Victoria, yep, we're skiding off about how we're doing all this. If you go to the Northern Territory, nothing. You go to Western Australia, different policies, different practice. You've got virtually seven states and territories that are doing, running different ways of working, different ways of engaging, no levels, no, no, no you know, um, level playing field around how you engage or get out better outcomes. Um, we're in an absolute crisis with Aboriginal children. The poverty levels, we live in the most po impoverished suburbs. In Victoria here, the, the public housing determines where we live. So almost all of the families that are engaged in child protection live in the most impoverished suburbs. So what's the future for them? So, well, coming to the future, tell me, what kind of reform, systemic reform, would you like to see in terms of Indigenous Affairs children and how do you think, from your massive experience across leadership and policy, how do you think we should get there? Look, I think that there's been a lot of work, and I, I know Robert's on the Rob Productivity Commission, and they produce really great reports every year that talks about how dire the situation, and we try to talk about the positive. And yes, we are. 80% of the population is doing much better, but what is it within the 80%? And so the things that are in the 80%, strong Aboriginal culture, strong connection, good early years, but, you know, and even for some of the most impoverished, they're starting to move into that 80%. So it is, but it is a lot of it. And if anybody really looks up self-determination theory, that theory really talks about autonomy and empowerment. And 
you know, to experience self-determination, to be able to make decisions, to be able to make a choice where you live, those things many Aboriginal people don't, or many people in poverty don't experience. So many people all over Australia. And when looking up, I wanted to look up what self-determination would look like for a child, and particularly for a child in child protection. And so I looked up nationally, where was there any legislation on that? And the only place I could find it was within a national disability framework, would you believe? Because they view that children within a disability context have no rights and can't and don't get cho good choices. So why is that different from child protection? Yeah. You know, I mean... And it's that deficit framework again, That's isn't exactly it? right. All right. But, but I'm just going to make the same... Muriel's right, but, you know, we do actually know what works. And this is the strange thing in the Indigenous stuff. Muriel has been around this stuff for, forever, and I've been around it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, <laughs> we actually do know what works. Uh, the Overcoming Indigenous Disadvantage report that... Uh, Muriel's referred to it. I was the convener of that for nine and a half years, consistently did research on what works in Indigenous communities. So why isn't it um, enacted? And what happens... And that's the, that is the question. So we do actually know those elements. One of those is self-determination. There's four or five that are consistent in those. Putting aside the social determinants, those things that are underpinning it. Um, and that is because every time we enter... A, the governments are obsessed with new policies... Mm. And what's happened in this space is over a period of at least 50 years, but certainly the last 30, every new government and every new minister comes in and is immediately confronted by the fact that it doesn't work. Mm. And he or she will immediately say, well, we need a new approach. And what we've seen consistently, unlike most other areas in health and education where we have a quality improvement framework, basically in education we do not say it's all failing. We say we will improve these particular deficits or fill these gaps. We do exactly the same in health. We do not radically change the system every two to three years. Australia is actually very good at social systems, despite what we're saying today. When we come to Indigenous, it's completely different. Every two to three years, there's a completely new approach to policy. And I, spoke, I said to one of the leaders of one of the parties, he, he got up and talked about new policies, and I said, we don't need new policies. We need any policies delivered well over a long period of time. OK, but so and let me so bring you to the point. the issue is this. Yes. Stick with a policy and improve it. But how do we do that? Because they're not doing that. Well... That's the great challenge. That's well, I mean, well, Bridget... Well, but, yeah. well one, of the, one of the... I agree with you about age, uh, being my, generally, about uh, the way in which disability and ageing have... There have been really big changes. But the re, one of the big issues is that word, that funny word called class. All of us get old. We, so middle-class people are very good at saying, this is what I want for my old age. Sure. Unfortunately, the child protection system, as I showed this morning, is focused on the most deprived and most marginalised people. And they don't all ha have a voice to say. They are demonised, they're shamed, they internalise the shame. So what we need to do, which has happened, and I mentioned it this morning in places like New York, we need to build coalitions of solidarity. We need to work sure. together actually. And it's not about, it's about acknowledging our differences as well as our similarities. And we need to use our skills. I, I mentioned that I'd done some work on adoption this morning. And, one of, and one of, when we launched our report, uh, the BBC contacted me and they said to me, uh, you know, when we run programmes on adoption, we get so many people ringing up compared to when we do something on child protection. And I said, oh, that." I wonder why that is. And she said, well, it's because loads of middle-class people adopt. So mm. they're very good at talking about their problems mm. and what's going wrong. And they hate the child protection system. They can't believe All that right. it's used. So they have a voice and they're using they it. Voice. And to pick up what Robert said earlier too then, how do we give children, Indigenous and not, a voice? How do we do that in terms of, uh, of our inquiries and our reform? Well, the first thing you've got to do is talk to them. And it's most <laughs> astonishing how many agencies don't talk to children and young people. So in the Royal Commission, we, we, had, we had over 100 pieces of commissioned research. Four of those were in relation to children themselves. And they actually went out and spoke to children in out-of-home care, in school settings and others. And I, as a commissioner, actually met with children in forums around Australia. And it was remarkable, not only what they said was insightful, but it was actually consistent with what you would expect to be good practice. But they told us the way in which 
you could approach those issues. And let me just give you one example of that. In a piece of research done by the Australian Catholic University talking to children, we were talking about how would you disclose sexual abuse in the school environment. And they said to us, we would look at how the school is dealing with bullying. Because bullying, which is connected to sexual abuse and other forms of abuse generally, is a proxy indicator for safety. And if the school can't deal with bullying mm. or won't deal with bullying, I'm not going to talk about something far more serious. Mm. Mm. Now, that simple insight coming from kids, of course, when you hear it, is just astonishingly mm. common sense. Yeah. And that's mm. what we said. The second thing is, do we involve children and young people in the design of our programs and our policies in a genuine way, either through good quality research or direct focus groups, and say, what would be relevant? So what does a child think is safe in a family environment? Now, it's not what I think is safe, and it's not what my children will think is safe. It is quite different, yet we don't bring that into it. The third thing about it is that we have to stop talking about the deficits all the time, even in the Indigenous space. It's killing us. Um, I've come to a view that whilst I said the system has to be broken enough for reform to occur, that is true. But in the Indigenous space and some of the areas we're talking about, that is well beyond that. We are way beyond knowing the system is broken. We now have to talk in a different language. And that language is much more about strengths and finding the positives and building on the future. Bad news will not bring about reform in some of these areas. So we have to articulate different knowledge. That's back to children. Children talk optimistically about the future, hopefulness about their own future and hopefulness in families. Now, that's gilding the lily too much because I've spoken to many children that don't hold a view of the world that's positive at all. But I do actually think we have to use a different discourse in relation to children. And I think a, a unanimity of view on that. Can I ask you then about media? How crucial is media here in terms of reform? Who wants to look there? I think media can be friend and full. Actually, they can be friend and full. Uh, I've seen some great examples in recent times of, uh, I mentioned them this morning, women journalists really, really working very closely with uh, parents, particularly mothers who've been through the child protection story system and helping them to tell their stories extremely well. But as we know, the media can be extremely problematic. They, they seek very sensationalist headlines, yeah, they, exactly. they foment othering, they demonise people and they want to blame. They want to blame. So it's important to get them on side in it's terms crucial. of... It's crucial. Yes. As we saw side. in Ireland perhaps recently with yep. the referendum, yep. with women telling their stories. Absolutely. It was just so powerful, Absolutely. wasn't it? Yep. Nicholas, you wanted to say something? Well, I'm reminded that, that um, Paul Krugman says that reality has a natural liberal bias. Um, he means liberal in the American sense. Um, and the media on these subjects have a... And I'm not saying much more than Bridget has, but in a different way. The media has a natural reactive sensationalist bias. Um, why are we still pursuing income management in Aboriginal communities when one uh, evaluation after another comes back telling us it's certainly not great? You know, there are some bits sure. of it that work quite well and most of it doesn't. But we do it again and again because this is really about arteries and capillaries. We, it, it's a good story to tell. Income management makes sense, makes sense to me. I just happen to know that it doesn't work. I've just a little bit of additional factual information. Um, so, but, but we do it again and again. And we have rolling amnesia and the media and politicians um, uh, who are in that slipstream uh, are comp really can't travel very far from there because it's like you say, well, actually, prison doesn't work very well and all of a sudden, bang, you're being weak on crime and all the rest of it. So that's the way, we, that's the way political discourse works. Yeah, but aren't you letting the politicians off the hook a little sure. bit, bit too much well, there? Well, we've heard about incentives. They're reacting to the incentives. I'm not one who goes sort of waves his arm around, I do wave my arms around, um, <laughs> and says, we need leadership. Everyone's yeah. calling for leadership, for God's sake. Well, have a look at what we, what's going on and see, look at these arms, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> have a look at what's going on that and ask yourself, why is this lack of leadership there? That's All a right. more fertile question. There's two panellists waving their arms down that end. Can I go to Muriel and then, yeah. then I mean, Bridget? 
I, I think in the Aboriginal space, clearly, you know, we're often demonised by the media, and I think that positive stories, you know, um, you know, like recently we just had NAIDOC, and, and um, the theme this year because of her, I can, and every Aboriginal person has a female in their life, but it was just amazing to hear stories of survival. We, often we're not able to compete with, you know, mainstream Australia with their achievements um, in our you know, successes and roles. And so I think that um, we have to have a different way to, you know, to check. But the biggest issue for me is, is that a lot of people don't believe we're an Aboriginal person in Victoria because um, I'm not painted up at the moment. I'm not um, wearing a... Heaven forbid that if I ever wore a lap lap or a... Um, that would be frightening. That, that would be frightening, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Um, do you have to be so brutally honest? Um, <laughs> We've got one for you to try on a little bit You're later too, there. Robert. <laughs> um, yeah, you make a very valid point, and bad news is good news often, yeah, but isn't I, it? I think that, you know, for, for me, it, it's like when you want to hear a story about or do media, go to the Northern Territory, and, and yeah. when, you, when the Premier, Prime Minister wants to address something Aboriginal, he goes up there. Have you ever seen him do an Aboriginal story in Victoria? Never. Yeah. Okay. We do not exist. We are not, and we're, and and then there's othering. They call us the urban Aboriginals now. We're not even Aboriginal anymore. We're urban Aboriginal, and so it, it, it's it's othering, and it starts to create division for all Aboriginal people. And I oh, think right. that's. I'm looking at you, Bridget. Bring me hope. I am. <laughs> I'm just about to do that, actually. <laughs> um, a very hopeful, uh, it's very easy for us to get really depressed about the politicians and all this kind of thing. A really hopeful uh, lecture or a talk I heard from a colleague recently who has done the hard yards. She's gone out and she's talked to MPs about their constituency work, about the similarities between their constituency work and social work, actually, and how they cope with the kind of things that they get every Friday in their constituencies. And one of the things she's found out is how many of them very consciously do not break, build up deaths when they happen in their constituencies. They very clearly will not go with the media narrative. They refuse to be involved in it. The politicians aren't a completely homogenous block. The media aren't a completely homogenous block, although they're getting a bit too homogenous in some ways. So we have, you know, hope without critical thinking is naivety. I think critical thinking without hope is cynicism. I, I think that's right. And I think the number of social media channels opening yeah. up now where you have individuals with more followers than some newspapers. Absolutely. I just want to move on, though, because we've got several issues to cover. Just staying with you, Bridget, though, okay. we've talked about reform in all different colours and sizes. Is radical reform harder or easier than bitsy reform? Um... Oh, I'm naturally very suspicious of grand designs, and you know, uh, we've had uh, the last century is littered with examples of, you know, great utopian visions that were blueprints and were designed far away from the people. My own view is you go into communities, you work from the bottom up, you ask people what works for them, you get them involved, you get the politicians involved, you get the managers involved, you work together from the ground, you trial things. It does require persistence. We have a real situation in our country, and I know that it's happening here, both from what you've said, but from other people have told me, that people are very suspicious of us. They're very suspicious of the state. They fear the state. There's massive luck. And it's not just about child protection actually. People think, oh, it's just about social workers and child protection. Uh, if you look at all the barometers of trust surveys that are going on at the minute, sure. there has been a massive decline in trust in governments, in elites, in the media, in lawyers. So it, we're part of a bigger picture, actually. We're part of a bigger picture. We're probably at the sharp end of a bigger picture. So I think it's about going... Does any, anyone disagree with that? Uh, yeah, no, it's best. both. Um, and you mustn't... Uh, this is the danger for the sector itself. Um, you need both at once. A very significant change at the Commonwealth Government level in terms of a program design or funding will affect millions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And, it, and some of our greatest reforms in relation to social welfare and payment structures and the design of schemes at that level have had enormous impact, indeed, our education and health system, but also our social policy. So it is very important that we get we get very significant changes at the Commonwealth level, at the national level. The second thing is... I can demonstrate again and again that we are very good at quite radical systems change. It doesn't happen very often, but when it happens, it's very important. Just going back to a point that Nicholas raised, 
there's a very big distinction between this change and the way in which we do it in its implementation. And there's a number of weaknesses in, in all of the reforms that are going through at the moment. Mm. But that doesn't mean it diminish the fact that these are very substantial reforms and they have at their heart the right direction. What's missing is necessarily good implementation. What the sector does and other people in Australia is we attack the very scheme because of the implementation. Instead of saying, this is a terrific scheme, but we've got these five or six things wrong. In Australia, we bag the whole lot. And going back to your media one, that's the biggest gripe I've got. NDIS, whatever scheme you want we look at, doesn't matter which one, will have significant implementation problems. Mm. Some of the design of it is not right, but we we'll can fix that over time. Mm. The danger in Australia is we bag the whole lot. Then, of course, a politician reacts and says, well, it's all hopeless and we're going to mm. start again. Mm. So I, I just want to make the point that you've got to go from the ground up and at the same time you've got to go from the no, top I agree down. With you, and grand visions should yeah. never be consigned yeah. to the bin. And the no, sector sometimes has lost faith in the grand vision. All right. You shouldn't. Really brief on this, Robert, yes or no. Is there an end point to reform? Never. And how would you describe reform in Australia if I said reactive, strategic, stop and start? What would you say? Um, it's general, in Australia, it's genuinely reactive, but... If the galvanising consideration that I said before, if that is the body of people affected by the system, have a common view in one sense about what they want to achieve out of it, it'll actually be very positive. So it's reactive, but can be very positive. Okay. Um, but Australia is traditionally reactive. Muriel, you wanted to Look, say something? I guess on reform, I've seen so many inquiries, so many reviews, and they all promise a lot. But they don't deliver, for, particularly for Aboriginal. And we've seen even, like, we've got really great legislation. We've got, you know, conventions on the rights of the child that protect Indigenous. We've got charters. We've got everything. We've got really great Aboriginal child placement principle legislation across the nation. But no one complies with it. And nobody, and there's no penalty. There's no holding anybody accountable. And so when, when something comes out, average people go, oh, yeah, well, it'll be up to the whim of the government or the, the bureaucrats and, you know. And we, there's never any penalty or anybody that... And the media don't report. And, and we'll come July when the eight Australian Institute for Health and Welfare will put out the report and then there'll be a massive over-representation and then we'll all get called in to do media and then we move on to something else. Mm. Well, and that kind of... I was going to ask you that question. It comes to the issue of expectations here too, doesn't it? Expectations of the public, expectations of those running the systems, those who are subject to the systems. And, and, and I guess, Robert, you know, running the big inquiry that you just have, the expectations were huge. Did that weigh on your back that you were thinking the expectation is that we are going to stop the sexual abuse of children? Uh, the expectations are enormous in running a uh, Royal Commission and... Uh, it's not so much about stopping but necessarily, but diminishing, but absolutely. And those expectations were in the, the voices of, of the victims and survivors. It was in people in institutions that wanted to do a better job and acknowledge the foes. It was in the political level, but most importantly, it was in the community. The expectations of that inquiry were enormous and are enormous, and, uh, and they don't come along very often of that scale. But they're also, I think, going back to Muriel's point, most people that run inquiries, unless they're politically contrived, actually hope that their inquiry will make a difference. Yes. And if they do a good job, they have a capacity to make that difference. What Muriel's highlighted, there is a, there is a gap between the, the inquiry outcomes and actually delivery. But can I just deal with that? And it's a classic example in the Indigenous space. Um, when we had ATSI, ATSI was an organisation established to provide a voice for Aboriginal people and a means of developing regionally based service delivery. And, of course, at the centre of that, there was a real problem. The actual national board was corrupted in many ways. It was right that the government acted, but what the government did, together with the opposition mm. and at the behest of media and others, was abandon the whole project. Mm. And in that one swell swoop, we lost the very first time in Australia's history of a regional governance structure for the delivery of services in which Aboriginal people had a controlling interest. Mm. And we were on the brink of something extraordinary. And the flash of an eyelid... Literally, we lost it all. And for years and years after that, Australia had no way of delivering services to Aboriginal people on a regional basis, firstly, and by Aboriginal people. And how dumb can a nation be to be on the brink of something absolutely extraordinary with all the signs that was about to work and then overreacted because the centre of the hub was in fact corrupted? And we do that over and over again. So I think that's an example. Where, and the point about the optimistic point is we were so close 
that we can do it again. Mm. Yeah. Nicholas? Yeah, so if I ask myself, how do I... Uh, we, well, I think we sort of agree that the habits of media and the, the, the media political system of just sort of changing horses in midstream is a really big problem. And just saying politicians should show more leadership is just a, a wish. Um, so I've thought about this and I have a, a one, an idea. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, the idea is that... And, and think of that analogy... Uh, think of that story about child protection and the reunification, that there's an office here that's really doing a good job. I want to build an institution which is helping all these officers, helping them be self-transparent and taking that and allowing that information about how they're going to go up through the system. This is roughly, by the way, how Toyota revolutionised car manufacture. They didn't, write, they didn't treat their workers like lab rats in a Skinner box. They didn't try to stop them cheating. They assumed that they were turning up, think of Ned Kelly's sash, they assumed they were wanted to do a good job and put them in teams, gave them literally ten times as much training in statistical control management and they together in teams worked out how to build cars and this process, let that run for 15 years and all of a sudden Australians and Americans are claiming that Toyota, Toyotas are being dumped into Australia. They're not being dumped, they're just being produced phenomenally efficiently the most efficient cars in... Back 19 to childcare. Well, hang on, I've just one little story. <laughs> just take it easy. Um, the, the, the most high-quality cars in 1972 in the world were the Mercedes-Benz SLE and the Toyota Corolla, and they were, the, their approach to quality was quite different. So what, how can we do this? What is an analogy with this? Well, I call it the Evaluator General. The Evaluator General is a public officer that does not report to or is not directed by a minister. They have, they, they don't ju they're not just like an Auditor General sitting on top of a process and auditing it. They actually are the agency that builds the monitoring and evaluation system. And from the capillaries, we are building objective knowledge about what's working where. And that information becomes public in quite short order. And it seems to me that if a politician is going to bust up ATSIC next time, the politician will still... It might do that, but in the thing that replaces it, well, there's a better chance of hanging on to all these capillaries that are showing us the way and, and continuing to go. Who appoints the evaluated general? Well, we get the, the government... I mean, so far we don't do what they do in America with the Supreme Court. We tend to appoint people on merit to these agencies, but, you know, that's a... At the, to, just to keep the model simple, so I'm not reinventing the whole world, um, we'll just use the method we use to appoint the Auditor General, which is a, a respected, respectable person who's reporting and to the And I think high-level high evaluation is, is a critical issue and we've identified. But one of the issues the sector has to deal with is and we saw it in the Royal Commission, we've seen it in many of the inquiries that I've done, but I've also been in this sector um, since I was a kid, I think, um, uh, for good or bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, is actually, valuation is very poor in the sector, yeah. and uh, it's a sector-wide problem. Uh, it is very hard, I have to tell you honestly, in every inquiry that I've done that's involved um, this sector, broadly defined, um, it's been very hard to get evaluation, a good evaluation of effective of programs. Now, they do exist, and it's got better, but it actually is a real problem. When we actually look, for example, in the Royal Commission in relation to uh, programs that would assist victims and survivors of child sexual abuse or children that had suffered trauma, it was actually very difficult, almost impossible to find any evaluations of anything. When we looked at sex offender programs for prisoners um, and whether or not you were able to rehabilitate uh, sex offenders or not, uh, the evaluations were extremely difficult to find mm -hmm. and lacked coherency and, and consistency. And uh, time and time again, both in the Royal Commission and other inquiries, we've been let down by very poor quality evaluations in the sector. Now, I know there is improvements and I don't want to be critical of everyone, but it is a serious issue. So when you go to government, it's actually very hard for government to discern whether or not the program you've got 
yes. is good or not. Mm. Now, in the in Indigenous space, it's a different problem. They do very good quality evaluations after they failed. <laughs> so what we used to find there when I was uh, convener of the Overcome Indigenous, uh, you'd say to government, well, did you evaluate it? Yes. Uh, we evaluated it. When did you evaluate it? Well, when it mm. ceased. And it was always about evaluating for did it work or didn't it work, rather than evaluating it early and then saying this is about quality improvement. Mm. All right. So can I go to Bridget? Does anywhere in the world do this better than us or what do you want to say? I'm going to fall out with Robert here because mm. I think we're obsessed with programmes, actually. I think we have become completely dominated by programmes. And actually, do you know what? We don't do enough of. We don't do enough of as practitioners going into communities, working with communities, walking around communities, getting a feel of what it's like to live there, what it's like to shop there, what it's like to transport three kids to different schools at different times. Uh, Hilary Cotton, I mentioned the book to some people today, Radical Help. It's a fantastic book. It's about, and she's a social innovator, it's about actually getting a sense of, you know, for example, she worked in Bolivia and she was re they, she had a programme around getting kids to school and she was told one thing by the administration when she actually spent some time with the families, she found there was a completely different set of issues about why the kids weren't going to school. We need to develop knowledge about what people need to live well in their communities. Okay, so not that... programs that we get yes, from but, here. Actually, but, we get loads of programs but Bridget, from here. That's fine, and you can do that. But at the end of the day, governments will it will fund you through. A we program. have to no, educate governments. Issue... Yeah, so we have just... to educate governments. Well, yes, okay. but you can't move from a, a program-based government to something that isn't okay. that. You have to transition them through this. So, so can I just... If you can do I that, just, that's fine. But you've still got to say, how do you transition governments through this? All right. Can I just go to Bridget, though? Then you're talking about the power of the individual, too, in the system, isn't it? You know, I... I yeah, I think we all have a, an ethical responsibility to kind of... Yeah. So can I ask you, then, what role... There's all these individuals in the room who work in this sector. What role does an individual have in driving change, in understanding what's happening in those the, communities? The reason that I... I mean, I know it doesn't come across all the time, but the reason that I really try to do hopeful talk, and I know that it's not always the case, but is because I think certainly in England, social workers have become very uh, imbued with a sense of powerlessness, a sense of fatalism. I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, we went to Northern Ireland where the social workers told us that they were really fed up with the judges because the judges were always prescribing massive amounts of direct contact for children. And this was in adoption. And they were really fed up with them and they said it's really bad because it's too prescriptive. Mm. So we did a bit of digging around and we found out that actually the judges were just recommending it. It wasn't a court order. They hardly ever made a court order. It was really rare. And the social workers were really fed up about it, but never thought, actually, I'm not going to do it, or we're not going to do it. We're going to do it differently. Another quick example, we went to Scotland. Everyone said, post-adoption support is shocking. It's really bad. It's everywhere. It's really, really bad. We looked it up. We had a bit of a think. The law in Scotland, it's the only bit of the UK as enshrined as a right everybody's right to post-adoption support. But when we told the social workers, they went, oh, well, you know, but it doesn't really work. And we were going, we've lost a sense of agency, that we've lost a sense of, we've got, we, we are not just powerless victims. We have a responsibility to say, this isn't working, you're not implementing it this correctly. Oh. And the reason we have in England, just really, really quickly, is because we've been attacked so much that we've kind of internalised the sense of being victims oh. to a sense that's really disproportionate because we're not the real victims. The real victims are the families we're working with. So, and so we, our sense of victimisation has become disproportionate. So I, and we don't own our own power. We yes. don't own our own and I power. Think you, yeah, okay. I think you touched on this this morning and mm. so many people I talked at Morning Tea said, so how do we do that? How do we change our own narrative? How do we give ourselves permission or power to do what you're saying? Well, we, we join associations, we join unions, we talk to each other. My own view is we have a really big debate at the minute in England about we have something called social work awards. They're big, glitzy corporate affairs in London and you have to dress up and go to a hotel and you have to pay money for them. I think they're terrible. Actually, I think they're really not the way. I don't, I don't think us all sitting around saying how great we are and clapping each other on the back is awful, actually. I also think when David Cameron and uh, the, mid, the Prime Ministers of the time all went, social workers are heroes, etc., etc., my heart sank. Because I know how that's heard. That's heard by people as, oh, God, that's that 
bloody prime minister going on about how great they are. No wonder they're taking our kids away or whatever. You know, they're just doing what this really unpopular. We have to support each other. We have to help each other. We have to build. We have to. I want families to tell me how great I am. I don't want politicians to tell me how great I am. I want the community to tell me. I want them to welcome me into their community and say, I'm so glad to see you. And I've told so-and-so down the road that you're here. I want you to go around and see them. That's the value I want. So you want to increase the role of family in and protecting community. children and community. Yeah. But, you know, we used to be in partnerships with families and then they become suspects in a sense didn't they? Well, yeah, and that's the risk aversion. I mean, our Children Act still, as, as, as it's part of its guidance, it, 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 this, it, that we work in partnership. Uh, but it, over time, it's been chipped away at it. It was hard to do. It's really hard to do. It, there's not an equality in terms of the relationship. There's all sorts of things going on. But we did what we did try, at least. It was infused with... The, it's really hard now, and it's been dropped out of the new working together. We don't talk about working in partnership with families. We talk about listening to children, but we don't talk about working in partnership with families. And the two have to go together. Children Children are part of families, they're part of communities, they're part of networks, and they will always be part of them, even if they live hundreds of miles well, away. Well, then the question really is this, in Australian context, is what do you actually believe is, in fact, um, the, the, the way of approaching child protection within that family context? So the, the problem in Australia at the moment is that we have moved into a situation of removing children, um, sometimes for very good reasons, but often it's, it's event-driven. So what we see is we look at the family, we look at the circumstances, and we respond to an event. Those events might be fairly shocking or terrible. And because of the risk-averse reasons we talked yeah. about, that's what people are doing. So the question is, how do we reformulate that? What is our expectation for children within the family going forward? And one of the things that uh, I used to work a lot with vulnerable families when I was much younger in a voluntary capacity um, in, uh, in the inner city of Sydney, and I then worked in a program for children at risk of going into care... In fact, I met my wife through that. Uh, and one of the things that became clear is that for most families, most very vulnerable families, they actually cope reasonably well for a good portion of the time, mm. 80 90%. But they have many crises, and they're multiple crises, sometimes traumatic in nature. What happens if the system at the moment reacts to the crisis or the event and removes the child, sometimes necessarily, many times necessarily, but ultimately, what we have to do is to say, how do we stabilise the family so that it can deal with those crises? So that for most of the time it can cope, and then during those periods of crisis, we will try to work and support that family through it. In the program that we worked with children who are at risk of going to care, not one single child went into care. And the most important part was something Richard said. First, it was a relationship-based model. And secondly, it actually said that the family is the best place for the child. Now, it wasn't always necessarily, but not one child was placed in care in that program. This is 30 years ago, and it wasn't a professionally developed program, and it didn't have evidence base, and by now today's standards, it would be seen as risky. It was. But what was critical is that there was somebody in the life of the family to enable them to go through the crisis, to give them support, to encourage the mother, even though the mother was, you know, in reckless circumstances. Mm. And it worked. And the problem with our model at the moment is we're actually intervening about events rather than sitting back and saying, that's a shocking event. Yes, we'll intervene. But actually, what do we need to put in place to stabilise it? And do we actually believe that children are, in fact, better off in the family, mm -hmm. a supported family? Now, there are some families where the children are not safe and they should not be there, absolutely. Mm. But we've gone to the other point. Now, how do we change this system from a reactionary system that is reacting to events, and some of them shocking, to something that actually says no. And the issue there is about the normalcy of that family. One of the things that I came from a reasonably well-off family, and I was dealing with Australia's poorest, the very, very poorest. You cannot get any poorer. Their normal and my normal are not the same. Mm -hmm. They are not the same. Mm -hmm. And the system at the moment has to work out what level of normalcy is it prepared to accept. Mm -hmm. And your point, Bridget, is we don't know it. Okay. We don't know them well risk. enough. Yeah. But you do. And so that's where your great body of knowledge comes in. But that's the big challenge for the child protection going forward. Uh, we, can we move it from an events-based, interventionist approach, trying to minimise risk to the child based on that event, to something different? Now, all of us that have been around this space have talked about early intervention, intensive family support models, integrated service delivery, multi-purpose family and children's services. I think we could name them. Mm. And all of them are right. But that's the challenge going forward. What is the family environment that we actually um, are seeking to support going forward 
within which the child, as Bridget rightly says, lives and is an critical part. And I don't think we're clear about that. Well, how would you answer that, Muriel? Well, I think, um, you know, I've been with VACA now for 20 years, so we run almost 50 programs across Victoria, so we've got about um, 500 staff, and so um, really getting a lot of leverage through um, programs that are early intervention, that prevention, and so being able to work for two hours a week, five hours a week, and 20 hours a week with families. So it is really a whole wraparound service. So there's, we've got to be able to have the capacity. Once upon a time when I first started at VACA, we used to be in lockdown more than we were open, I think, because of the anger of the family and the community. The community hated us. Our workers were challenged with the need in the community. So we had very few workers. We were quite at the bottom of the cliff waiting for families to fall off. And that's often where Aboriginal services are funded to deliver. We have to move our services to much more front front end to be able to work at soft entry points to be able to deliver. I want to take your questions now, so just raise your hand and I'll get a microphone to you. But you also told me on the phone government departments have to work more closely together too, don't they? You had a... Yeah, we work very closely, particularly now we're doing Aboriginal guardianship. So we have... Um, we're emulating, obviously, government. So we've got protocols with, with courts, with police, with... And so we work with L17s, which are the police notifications on family violence. So but, we work across a lot of areas. But states don't necessarily. Robert, I don't think we have a uniform no. means of child protection even in this country. Um, no, we don't. And, and there is a national uh, child protection framework, which is due for yep. renewal in 2020. Um, the Commonwealth has had an, an ambiguous uh, interest in this area for some time. It's prepared to lead various initiatives, but it's not been an active player until recently, and we don't have that. But can I make one comment about uh, Muriel's point? Um, I'm not sure that we could actually get government silos to work together. What I have come to the view is that we can get commonality of policy and then we bring it together at the service delivery interface. That is the front line. So uh, I know this is heresy, but I've given up on trying to get government agencies to work together in the streams. OK. What we do is we bring them together at policy and then we work out a service delivery model that brings it together at the coalface. And that model, I think, has great prospects for success. All right. Yeah, I'm going to just finish it there so we can get through some questions. Please raise your hand and we'll get through as many as we can, starting here with Catherine. Thanks. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your thoughts. Um, I kind of have two questions, really. One is, do you see there's value in reframing um, community members as um, context experts rather than, um, you know... Uh, the receiver of services, which a few of you have mentioned. Um, and the other point that concerns me, I think, um, Robert, you said that uh, people didn't care. What happened to care? Where did it go? Great pick-up. Robert, do you want to address that? Well, just if we can just use an analogy. I want to go back to disability. There we see uh, people with disability... Um, and their carers as active participants in the services that are now delivered to them, imperfectly. Let me make that point. <laughs> and that is a very big shift. Now, it's not a perfect shift, and for people with cognitive disabilities or psychosocial disabilities, mm. um, they're always going to have to have uh, exercise their rights through an intermediary or support person. But that's a very significant change in my life. I've been around disability services when I was much younger, and the changes we're now looking at are so significant. But the biggest one was to put the person with the disability um, at the centre, uh, not only as just a, receiver, a service recipient, but an active participant in the decisions being made. I'm not sure we see that in family and child practice, and I don't want to pre pretend to understand it, but I have to say that looking at the NGO sector generally, um, most of them espouse that view but actually don't practice it. Mm. My experience when I was Community and Service, Disability Services Commissioner, which oversighted all of the service providers by government and non-government in New South Wales for five years, most organisations, it was a service delivery model. And the families and the children were simply the recipients of those services. Mm. So the question is, not the answer, how do we engage them more in, this, in the process of supporting themselves rather than just being passive service service uh, recipients. Now, I know that in this room there will be people that will jump up and say, we'll be doing that, and I yeah, hope that's, that's true. Well, that's the thing, though, isn't it? So um, 
I was just talking earlier this week about uh, an organisation that said that it put people at the centre of everything they did, their users at the centre of everything that they did. Well, I said I immediately smelt a rat. Um, if you're not, if you don't say we strive to put people at the centre of everything we do, you haven't even turned up. Because we can never put people at the centre of what, of what we do because they're already in a disadvantaged state. Um, and that's why we're there. Um, so I see this as a very... This, if it's not... Uh, if it's glossed over... Uh, then you know you're dealing with propaganda and you know you're dealing... And sometimes people even believe the propaganda that they're mouthing. Uh, but, but, that, but, but, but anyway, for me, we, it, we have to see it as a, an aspiration which we will only ever imperfectly um, uh, achieve. And it was when I saw family by family that I thought, ah... So that's maybe what putting people at the centre might mean. Something completely different to what I'd seen before. I want to make one other comment. You, you talked about context experts, which is a nice way to put it. I actually... I, I mean, I'm actually... I don't like talking about the delivery of services, the joining up of services. If the services are to families, I think most of the services should be to social capital that we should have a model in our minds, and I think Bridget is saying something similar, that we, that, that, I mean, we do need to provide certain services to people and to families, but we want the healing to come from the communities, from the people, not from us. OK, can I leave it there and go to our next question? Thank you, ma'am. Hi there. My name is Mari and I'm from the Valuing Children Initiative. I suppose I was just a bit concerned, is the word I've used to describe it, when you talked about the most effective um, system reforms and the reform is driven by the people that system directly affects. I suppose I'd like to hear more about your comments around children and, and you know, how are children supposed to represent themselves when it comes to system change and from the perspective of, you know, we're adults here and we have more authority to um, cause change. So just more comment on children's well-being. Could I ask Bridget to take yeah. that? I was at a local authority, because I do, unashamedly, and I get into trouble for this all the time, I do tend to talk about families rather than children. And I'm always getting into trouble from people saying to me, you, you know, what about children's rights and voice? But last week I was at a local authority, which I think is making great strides in all sorts of ways. And one of the things, we were talking about permanency and rethinking permanency, and uh, one of the things that came across really strongly from the young people there and from the workers there was that they really, really had engaged young people. And that had been a really systematic, ongoing process. So they had really engaged them in their system changed change. So I think it's very possible to do it. I think it's difficult if they're very, very young, but, but I, of course it's possible to do it. And there's a lot of it happening, actually. Um, but my own view is that often we're very comfortable about talking to young people. This is in England, but we're not at all confident about talking to their parents. And we're certainly not confident about talking to their fathers. So just, maybe one, just one sec. In the new child, mandatory child safe standards that will apply to all agencies that provide services to children by the states and territory governments um, through their legislation, one of the standards is, in fact, engagement with children. And that compulsory standard that will apply, and it already applies in Victoria and in other, a couple of other states, is actually going to be given a, a real test. How will you do that? And the point that Bridget raised earlier is about giving agency to children. Mm -hmm. And now, very young children, very vulnerable children, that, that has uh, difficult mm -hmm. concepts. But it's actually about the notion of do you or do you not want to give agency to mm -hmm. children and or their interests? Mm -hmm. And the child safe standards have as one of those standards that principle. Thank you. Our next question. Um, it's Cathy Humphreys from the University of Melbourne. I am very galvanised by the issues of poverty that have been raised today and the relationship with the child protection system or protecting children and the good society. I guess one of the striking, and I think absolutely galvanising issues, is Centrelink payments at the moment. You know, we know that there's an, that there's an algorithm that doesn't work <laughs> and that actually 
families can't get payments and that children are being extraordinarily disadvantaged by the way in which the Centrelink system is working. We had for a while a strong advocacy campaign, but it died very quickly. And I think there was a little bit of tweaking done by government to do something more so that there were maybe less people affected. But it was a point where, in fact, I think our lack of ability to sustain a um, in, and bring welfare recipients together in, in a rights-based fashion has not been able to be continued. And that whole issue... I mean, I think that people are extraordinarily disadvantaged at the moment by a system that's actually working against them and we seem to be doing nothing. Yeah. Who'd like to respond to that? Robert? You've run so many inquiries. You understand how well, government works. It's go a pretty another, good point. I can go to another part of my life. I was president of the Australian Council of Social Service for five years, so I know a lot about campaigning on social services. Um, I can't answer the question as to why. I mean, I can just look at the one payment that I, I want to... that stands out, the New Start payment. Um, you know, none of us have been successful, despite every effort and how talented the agencies and organisations are, to get either side of Parliament to, to move that poverty uh, payment up have been completely unsuccessful. Mm. And it, it's a mystery to me. Um, no amount of policy research, um, anything, will make any difference. It's just stock. So here we have a payment that is well below the poverty line. It causes enormous disadvantage. All the evidence has been there for almost years. We cannot get it moved. So I can only say to you, something's wrong in our advocacy around you know, the social security system. And it's not for the want of good groups and good advocacy groups, but I can't give you the answer to how to fix it at the moment because okay. I'm dumbstruck. Thank I you, Nicholas. You want to add something there? Yeah, so I gave a talk to a group, uh, a conference called Communities in Control, about a, what, what does a political system that supports equality look like? And I, the, the Athenians had a word for a concept in politics and law that we actually don't have. So we have the notion of freedom of speech, and the Athenians had a word for that, although that word, parhesia, actually means speaking truth to power, which got Socrates into some trouble, I can tell you. Um, but the Athenians also had another political idea about their democracy, and that was isegoria, which means equality of speech. And we don't have equality of speech. Um, the commun less than 50% of the community are, uh, have university degrees, 90-something percent of their parliamentarians have university degrees, 90-something percent of the media have university degrees and so on. When we talk about diversity, we talk about everything but that particular issue. We don't talk about, and this is a class issue, um, we don't talk about, if, you, if I might be so bold, the, work, the war on the working class, which is turning up in our... Isegaria is turning up in our toxified political system as one nation, as a group of people who want to be spoken to in their language, not the language that... They get their fingers, people wag their fingers at them and tell them that they're not speaking in the appropriate way. Uh, so what's the response to that? i am been very vigorous in trying to find ways of bringing things like citizen juries more vigorously into our politics. A citizen jury is just like a, like a legal jury, a selection of... And, and these were run in... In, they, these were the basic sinews of government in the Athenian, in the democracy in Athens. People chosen at random got into groups given time to think about things and you find that lots of things that are toxic about our system, its tendency to polarise, its tendency to sensationalise, its tendency for groups to compete with each other, those are detoxed in very powerful ways. People get into these groups and they go, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, we really want to do something about that. So those are some things that I think are worth thinking about. Okay, thank you. Our next question, Chris. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a question about social capital. So the idea has come up that building social capital is perhaps a way that we should approach things instead of through programs. And I've also heard a lot about we need to go into the community and see what the community wants. And I, I would completely agree with both of those ideas. But communities are not discrete communities. And we have multiple identities and we belong to lots of different types of community. 
Um, and I'm also, it's also very easy for us to slip into language about the people over here that are vulnerable and need services and us, the rest of us, who are doing okay. But actually, it, those boundaries are not there. And so I'm, I'm asking whether you think there should be more universal service provision, not because of the stigma of asking for help, but because it, it's possible that with more universal things in place, I avoid the word program, we might get that interconnectedness and that social capital. And I'm thinking particularly of playgroups, because that's what I'm working on, where mm -hmm. we target certain groups to receive mm -hmm. playgroup services, and we don't notice that wider community playgroups are falling apart. Yeah. But mothers' groups are something where we probably do yeah. that much better because they are yeah. a more universal, yeah. normalised, sure. if you like, thing. Yeah. Um, well, can I... Oh, can I just can start, I, Bridget? Uh, well, well, just really and then I'll go to you, Nicholas. I mean, you're absolutely right. I apologise for my sloppy use of the word community. Yes. No, no, but it, it, you, we're, yeah, there are all sorts of communities, virtual communities, communities, all sorts of things going on. I was merely trying to get a kind of sense of moving away from the notion of us as individuals. And I think it makes it very challenging, the fact that we have multiple identities and we're part of multiple communities. But I still think, particularly when, when we have children, that there is inevitably a bit of place-based stuff going on. On, that the kids are going to nurseries and they're going to schools and stuff, and that that's a place that we that's when we can be doing place based stuff. On your other thing, one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done in my life was uh, be uh, an evaluator for Sure Start, a Sure Start program, which was over five years. Sure Start was neighbourhood based; anyone could turn up as long as they had kids over a, under a certain age. Uh, they were varied around the country, uh, uh, but they were extraordinarily. They were about reaching out, being accessible; anyone could go, uh, and uh, I think that they were incredibly helpful so I totally agree with you I hear I, oh, the amount of Lord Justice McFarlane recently who's now just about to become the president of the court said do you know it's easier to get uh, over the threshold to get a court order at the minute than it is to get into a family support place now that is just bonkers. Uh, you know, we're putting so much energy into thresholds and eligibility criteria and gatekeeping, and it's for this, and you have to have two children removed before you can go on this programme. And you, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, you get the point. Just yeah, in, I totally get what you're in, saying. In relation to Australia, we have two things. We have firstly a very targeted social security system, unlike many of the other European countries that have a more of a, a social insurance system. So we are a needs-based social welfare system, quite different to that which exists in most of Europe. But we do have universal access to a number of things, education, health and so on. Um, and we do that. And we need to do that. But the real reason we need to do it is very... It's a different one. It's a political reason. And that is in order to, to meet the needs of those at uh, the lower level of society in terms of socioeconomic services, you need the permission of the middle class. And in Australian political society, if the middle class doesn't give a government permission to do that, it gets withdrawn. So the Howard government uh, recognised in its very first term that the middle of Australia was discomforted by the level of assistance that was being given to those on the lower level. The Pauline Hansons developed a new notion of fairness. If I don't get it, it's not fair. <laughs> and that resonated. And so the response by the Howard government was to introduce a whole lot of middle class welfare. And the reason for that was to assuage the concerns of the middle class, but it also gives permission for them to do other things. So universality actually has a political motive to it. And it's quite a sophisticated concept beyond whether or not you get the service. The problem, however, is it all has resource problems. And so the issue you have to say, universal expensive. service is fine, but if we are going to pay for that, is that a good use of those dollars and cents? And that's up for grabs. OK, before our next question, Nicholas, did you want yeah. to add something? Um, so can I just take you up on this idea that one is supporting social capital rather than programs. I was talking about focusing programs on building social capital. Um, so if you think about something like Family by Family, which is a family mentoring scheme, you are, you are the way I thought about it is, in a therapeutic sense, you're building uh, something through an empathic bond, not just through delivering a bunch of services, and you are delivering the cure through social capital, in this case, just between two neighbours. Um, so um, that there... Now, now, let me just take you through uh, 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 the, the next stage of the thought, which is that we noticed uh, in Family by Family that a lot of things 
that were not being diagnosed, for instance, autism spe kids <coughs> not on the, who were on the autism spectrum disorder, were not being diagnosed by the families on their own or by the system, and they weren't actually... So the government had those services in there, and they thought of these areas as over-serviced, but the services weren't getting used. The mentoring families were being trained, and they were saying, why don't we take your kid down to these services? So that leads to the question of what I call family by family as a platform. Um, so, um, uh, so, so what you're then doing is you're saying, here's two systems. Here are two ways of going about delivering these. Now, the system is incapable of get, getting anywhere near that level of experimentation, but that's the sort of pathway that we might try and explore. Muriel. Yeah, I, I mean, I think universalism is working really well for the Aboriginal community because in child welfare we're now running supported playgroups and so we see the relationship so through child protection we can see better um, access and use of access to support children but also maternal and child health. Now we're funded to do maternal and child health and work with maternal and child health and those vulnerable families so I think universalism of obviously use, using the universal platform is a great way for Aboriginal communities but I think again back to it's the othering and sometimes not thinking about mm. that we can do it. We have to, to get the funding for supported playgroups we've got to go through the Aboriginal budget. It's not through the fact that supported playgroups are funded through a mainstream budget. We don't get any of the mainstream dollars. We get the Aboriginal dollars. And Thank so we get put over there. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, Antonia has our next question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, compared to yesterday, I promise I'll be brief. Um, so you talked uh, earlier around um, both politicians and media kind of in a kind of um, tango around reactivity um, and a sort of obsession with the novel. My question is, is, there, is it possible to incentivise politicians <laughs> and the media to behave counter to their natural inclinations? Um, and what would that involve? What a cracker of a question. Muriel, can you take the lead there? You should answer that. Uh, <laughs> I think we've always had... Aboriginal people have always had issues with people that come from really middle-class families, even in the court system, in child protection, in policing and justice. We've all always had to deal with the, the values and principles that people are grown with. And, and even when looking at the needs of our community, we're all, often talking to people that already have an agenda or told they, they're determining what the direction. And so from our point of view, yes, I mean, I remember when Mal Bruff, when, the, um, when he was talking about the intervention into the Northern Territory, I was chairperson of SNAKE and I said to him, you don't need an, it really isn't about an intervention, we need a therapeutic approach. If there, are, if there is sexual abuse, where are you going to take these kids? Where are you going to put them? How are you going to treat, how are you going to, and he just went into, not was sending in the army. So, I mean, there's already, there's this view, of, particularly of Aboriginal, that it's got to be punitive and that's the only way that we can approach it. But I think, you know, from a point of view of, I'm gobsmacked every day at what comes out of some of the politicians' mouth about how simply, simplistic, you know, the basics card is put up as, as something that... Could. And then you've got the other side of Aboriginal politics, Warren Mundine, and others that think that, you know, adoption and taking kids and taking them away from families is the best solution. Those things won't work. Robert, 18 national inquiries. You've dealt with so many politicians. <laughs> Do you see a time or a way where popularism won't be the driving force of their actions? Um, you have to get popularism together with good policy, and that's the challenge. Mm. Of course, po po politicians have to be popular to be elected, so right. why would you ask them not to be popular? So, that's an, so my view is, of course we want them to be popular. That's not the issue. Is can you can you meet the popular agenda and have good policies? And the answer is absolutely yes. There are many instances where good policy and good politics comes together, and we've seen that over time. The establishment of Medicare, mm. the establishment of our university systems in the early days, a number of the systems that I've talked about. Australia actually does many of the things very well. The second thing is most of our systems are not reactionary to the political cycle in the way people keep saying. Our health and education systems fundamentally don't change from election to election. So the question is, in the areas where we're getting a disconnect between populism and good policy, they're the ones we've got to concentrate on. And Muriel's mentioned one and there's several others. So I think we have to work in those areas and say, well, why is it working OK there? How do we learn from that to bring that across into these other 
very contentious areas. Is it fair to say that's harder now, though? You mentioned Medicare yes. Public Housing, which was, yes. what, 1972 mm. or something? Yes, it's much harder. And yeah. is that driven by social media and the advocacy where it's everyone has access to...? Uh, the first thing we shouldn't do is there was not a golden age. The Australians live in this sort of notion there was this golden age of reform. Reform has always been exceptionally difficult and tough. But there have been, in the past, coalescing across the political spectrum and the willingness of the Australian community. Today, everything is criticised from the instant you open your mouth about it. So politicians are in an environment where there is an instant, negative, mm. aggressive, almost threatening approach on every single initiative they put forward. They have to focus on not making slips. And so that is a very dangerous culture. And it's a culture of meanness and mean-spiritedness. And it's real. And that's making it very difficult for politicians to hold the line. Mm. I don't think they've fundamentally changed as politicians, and I don't think good policies fundamentally changed. But those initial first uh, flourishes can be devastating. Mm. And you're seeing that at the moment in relation to the e-health. Now, I don't want to comment on the e-health scheme, but instantly this week we're starting to see really quite vicious campaigns about it. And I think he's another one. Another reform is about to be attacked um, in a way that sometimes misses uh, very complex and important issues. But it may not be a good reform. That mm. may be advocacy. No, no, I'm not saying that. There's a lot of reforms that aren't. Mm. Can I have one minute? Um, we think about a democracy is about the will of the people. Let me put a, an alternative proposition to you. It should be about the considered will of the people. We know what the will of the people is. We poll it every day. When people get microphones stuffed into their faces, they're walking out of the supermarket and they're on TV. We could... In, we could create an institution to give us a window on the considered will of the people. We could fund a citizen's chamber. We could begin by giving it no power other than to run its own affairs. 100, 200 Australians chosen at random, funded to meet regularly to consider issues. And then we would see what the considered will of the people is. I think if we did, some of these impossible uh, policy areas would shift. And I don't think we would have abolished carbon pricing, which, by the way, is costing the budget $11 billion, because people would have seen what an absolute crock that was. Um, we've got to end here, and I just want to ask each of you a very quick final question. I'll start with you, Nicholas. Yes or no, is system reform dead? Um, when was it alive? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm hoping our hope and optimism factor will improve as well, I it go depends down. What you, it depends what you mean by reform and... Um, I'm pretty comfortable with the way Robert's been talking about it. Mm, yeah. um, as you can see, I'm full of frustration about certain <laughs> things. Uh, but you keep working away. What more can right. you do? All right, Robert, your question is, you've done 18 inquiries. You're making me very old. And <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed and we're very lucky to have you here. What do you think is the big inquiry that we need and will be next? Mm -hmm. um, it's actually mental health. Mm. Uh, in a very specific sense, the, of all the human service areas, it's the only one that hasn't really been scrutinised in a thorough way. Uh, so if you ask for that, it's that. Um, and more globally, I think the issue is about how do we actually change the way in which we measure our society into one that measures the well-being away from some of the indicators. Now, that's an old issue, but that's a different issue. But the actual next big human service area is mental health. Muriel, can I ask you, when we wake up in two weeks' time, and this conference is, has been over for a fortnight, what do you want each of us to remember? What's the message you want to leave us with? Um, because, I mean, I come to this conference, I go to conferences all the time, and I think it's wanting to leave with the memory that um, Aboriginal people have come a long way. Both my mum and my dad came off missions, so my dad came off Lake Tyers Mission, my mum of Kamragunja, and so they did year three. They raised nine children. In, we lived in abject po poverty. Um, as a young mum, I washed pigs, I plucked chickens, I did the work I did. As a young child, I, I picked beans to help to, towards. And so, a, as an Aboriginal people thinking, not that long ago, we were on missions and reserves. And I want people to think, I want to be able to know that two weeks from now people will remember that we've come a long way as Aboriginal yeah. people. We are in the room, we've got voice, we can add. And I think that the greatest um, thing that anybody and everybody can do for Aboriginal people is to let us have our culture and develop our culture and have our culture inform the practice, the theory, the evidence base and, you know, 
be able to have that as part because people talk today about um, what, what do young people say and do we hear the voice of young people at every forum they're saying. We're not taught anything about our culture. Our elders have been told they can't share their stories. And so kids are growing up without that and feel that that's the greatest um, you know, disadvantage that they have. So in two weeks, as I said, um, and, and just thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Yeah. yeah. And finally, to Bridget, how could each of us think or do or advocate or even research differently after this conference? Too hard. At too this hard. Day. They're all That's too hard. That's much too hard. Just answer another question. I'm going to answer another question. I actually. I'm Simon going to answer Green. your question, uh -oh. or, or uh, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to disappoint Anne. Uh, you know, she really wanted some danger, so I'm going to quote. <laughs> Give us danger. I'm going to quote an Italian Marxist, actually. Ah, I'm a, Gramsci. Uh, Gramsci. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Right. We keep going. We have to keep cheerful going. Cheerful pessimists, all. Yeah, cheerful pessimists. Yeah. Us leaving. Answer Muriel's question. The question I asked Muriel then. Yeah. It, when yeah. you get on that plane and you yeah. go back, what, it, what is it that you want the researchers, the, the, the service delivery experts, the, the professionals in this room to, to, to remember and to act on? Can I have two things? Yeah. One is I, I really, really love, and I had been reading a bit, uh, about the idea of citizens' uh, forums. And I know they've, they've been used in Ireland and have really improved the quality of public discourse because we did something a little bit similar with the adoption inquiry. We brought together birth parents, adoptive parents, adopted people, social workers into the same room, and we got them talking to each other for a day. And, and something extraordinary and magical happened in that process. But the second thing is, surprise, surprise, I want us to remember that poverty really matters. Mm. It's not the wallpaper of practice. It's not just sitting there when you walk into the room. It interacts with everything that families have mm. to think about and do every day. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for a fabulous <laughs>